Hello and welcome back to Restore Pet Podcast with me, your host Jack Cole. So today I'm joined by Mark Henderson from the Red Squirrels Survival Trust. So welcome, Mark. Thank you for joining me. And first of all, could you tell us, by general overview, what is a red squirrel? Its ecology, life cycle diet, and its uh, preferred habitat. Sure. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me, Jack. Um, so Eurasian red squirrel uh, is native to the UK. Uh, it's been with us for quite a while since the uh, since the Ice Age. Um, it's um, an arboreal or tree-dwelling uh, member of the rodent family. Um, in terms of lifespan, not terribly long um, in the wild. Uh, three to five years is not uncommon. Um, they're young, um, are called kittens or kits. Um, they're born primarily two sort of uh, breeding periods in the uh, in the year in early spring and again in late summer um again sadly the um, the kits don't have a uh, a particularly good uh, mortality average um less than 50 percent make it to one year so obviously it puts quite a quite a pressure on uh, on the population sizes um in terms of diet mainly seeds and nuts from trees but depending on the season uh and availability, they'll also eat buds and fruit and um, even dried fungi. They're known for uh, for taking uh, fungi and, and actually propping it in the tree where they live uh, and allowing it to dry out and then coming back to it, uh, coming back to it later. Um, and uh, unlike popular perception, actually acorns are not a primary uh, source of food for red squirrels. Uh, it's more greys. Uh, the grey squirrels, their digestive systems are able to uh, deal with the tannins and stuff associated with acorns so it's better suited to them um in terms of habitat the uh they actually prefer and and have lived for hundreds and hundreds of years in broadleaf and coniferous woodland um but they've the remaining populations that we have left in in the uk unfortunately have been driven into pretty much exclusively coniferous forests um by we're a big part of it. We 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 seem to continue to put pressure on remaining tree cover um, uh, around the UK, and also with the grey squirrels out competing them in the broadleaf areas where the uh, the principal food stocks are. I guess you sort of went brought in there a little bit about their current distribution. Would you mind just expanding on that a little bit further, particularly with the interplay with red squirrels, uh, with grey squirrels, I should say? Yeah, sure. Um, so the, re the remaining populations we have are, are, are pretty much split from uh, the south of England um, and, and then a big gap through to the north of England. So in the south, we've got um, particularly islands. So the Isle of Wight, uh, Brown Sea Island, Fursey and Green Island. Um, they, uh, because they're islands and therefore the greys have been unable to get across to the islands, we've got remaining uh, populations there that have thrived, uh, that have thrived pretty well. A um, couple of others in the south, um, are mainly due to um, physical translocations. So there's a uh, Mersey Island, which is near Colchester. Um, they did a translocation in and reintroduced them because they had originally had squirrels on the island in 2011. Um, and they've got a very nice thriving little population going there now. Uh, Tresco in the Scilly Isles was a, a similar, but that was a, an introduction. They'd never been seen there before around the same time. Um, Jersey, uh, introduced the species actually in uh, the late 1800s, around the time when uh, when other people in England were busy introducing the grey squirrels. Um, Jersey now has a population of about 500 or so. Um, other than that, remnant populations in the wild, uh, we've got some in North Wales and Anglesey, uh, Formby in Lancashire, and then the majority are in the, the, the northernmost um, uh, counties of Cumbria and Northumberland. Uh, but between the south coast and the northern counties, it's pretty much grey only area. Um, then do we have a, up, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Do, do we have a rough idea of total numbers? Is that possible to calculate? Um, it's <laughs> it, it's something that's that's been a real kind of challenge um, because obviously um, it's very difficult them uh, you know to get them to turn up to a census and stuff. So uh, <laughs> yeah. and and because red squirrels actually are far less seen in the wild than than greys are so the the calculation numbers it's it's very difficult i mean the last calculations that were done were done probably 20 or 30 years ago and it can be anything from sort of 140,000 to 240,000 depending on which source 
uh, one looks at. But equally, those um, those estimations are given with a, a whole bunch of caveats as to why they could be it's, it's significantly wrong. Um, but it's it's normally accepted that it's somewhere around 200 odd thousand uh, reds. Um, in terms of the grey presence, it's, it, it does extend, obviously, from England into Scotland, um, through the borders, central lowlands, um, and they've even been seen as far north up uh, beyond Perth. Um, is that uh, red, sorry, talking about there? No, greys. Oh, it was greys. Oh, yeah, greys have, have, well. have been seen that far north. Um, wow. and, and it's important, grey squirrels live in much higher densities than reds, often by more than 10 to 1. Um, so uh, there was a grey population in Aberdeen, uh, which, believe it or not, through some genetic study that uh, had been done, um, uh, they discovered that it was probably translocated from the New Forest, and they were moved up there in, in, in the 1970s. Uh, but they've almost now been completely removed, and the Reds have, have subsequently returned to both the city and the surrounding area. Something else that has been devastating for Red Squirrels is the squirrel pox virus. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what it is, where it came from, and what can be done to prevent its spread or hopefully one day eradicate it. Yeah, I, um, SQPV, as it's known, squirrel pox virus, um, it had never been evidenced in the UK prior to the arrival of the grey squirrel. Um, it's carried by some of them asymptomatically, not all of them, um, but it's deadly to almost all uh, red squirrels. Um, the detection is generally one visual obviously a lot of volunteers have um uh feeders with cameras and things and that's often how it's detected and it's detected through seeing very visible lesions on uh, around the eyes mouth uh and genitals and also a good um, a good sign uh, um, a clear sign is if it, if the animal is very lethargic doesn't seem to be moving um moving particularly well um eventually it becomes unable to feed itself and 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 then eventually will die um in terms of how it moves from from greys to reds the, the the research is is inexact but the uh the theory at the moment is that from greys to reds it it moves through um uh parasitical uh, parasite movement um uh, because obviously the parasites are not terribly choosy about the uh, the fur color of the of the animal that they land on um but between reds the suspicion or the the evidence uh uh, and study work that's been done so far appears to be a little like COVID, that it's more uh, bodily fluids and um, uh, saliva and stuff that that, that transfer its on. Um, but once it does transfer, if it does spread, it can it can completely wipe out a colony in in a matter of weeks under a month. Um, normally, what happens is if there's any sign of the uh, of the virus appearing in any of the remnant populations the local volunteer groups they'll they'll take down all feed stations because that's obviously an area where um uh, reds will congregate if you like and, and 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 can be a transfer area um encourage the public to take down things like bird feeders and stuff again other areas where that may get both uh, not just reds mixing but reds and greys together um everything gets disinfected everything gets cleaned up and and until there are signs that the disease is gone um uh it and in terms of its appearance, it, it generally seems to appear in areas where grey squirrel population density is high. Um, at the moment, we're seeing Formby in Lancashire and North Wales seem to be unfortunately seeing a, a, a continued um, a recurrence of, 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 of the disease uh, breaking out. And sadly, this year it was actually detected in Dunfermline, which is the furthest north it's ever been seen. So that's been very worrying for the um, the Scottish red squirrel uh, conservation community. Um, at the moment, there's nothing that that really can be done other than just ensuring that reds and greys don't interact or or or, or try and uh, reduce the uh, the capacity for greys to get anywhere near where the red populations are. Is the uh, is the uh, is the is the method used by most of the uh, the groups at the moment? Um, there has been a call uh, for a vaccine solution to the uh, disease uh, that was put before the Welsh Senate. Um, even if that was successful, um, and it, and you know it is something so much in its infancy. Um, it's you know it's a program or a project that's that's not even been uh, looked at yet. It could take 
decades before something was was available and that may be too late um, so uh, at the moment the best methodology seems to be to ensure that the presence of gray squirrels is as reduced or or uh, or um, completely removed in order to make sure that they're not um, interacting in any way as sure. a way of reducing the risk okay and uh, speaking more broadly what is currently being done by the government and this isn't just on uh, scroll box virus, but what is currently being done by the government, uh, organisations, local groups, just to help red squirrels more generally in sort of, you know, general underground, what's, what's happening? What are people up to? Um, at government level, <laughs> it would be difficult to say much is being done, to be perfectly honest. Um, I think the, the, the key thing that's missing is that uh, at national level, we need to be establishing long-term goals and then building shorter-term projects and programs and things towards reaching those. And I don't see much evidence um, of that being done. And to be honest, if it wasn't for the volunteer groups in the key areas that we've got, then uh, where we have red squirrels remaining, I, I think they believe that if it wasn't for their work, then the game would already be up and, um, and the red squirrel would already be gone. Um, the again, I think most of the volunteers would agree that the work that they've been doing pretty much for the last twenty or more years, um, twenty or thirty years, is a, has achieved the kind of containment of the problem um, in 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 at least ensuring the survival of those remnant populations. But I think we really, as a government, we know we need to start looking at what we're doing as a as a policy towards invasive species generally um and obviously gray squirrels and red squirrels and stuff within that and and whether we want to be serious about those aims because again the um you know the sad thing with governments is that often there's a lot of um speech that they suspect is what people want to hear and then um an amazing lack of delivery behind it and and i think you know that's potentially one of the problems um there is a there is a grey squirrel action plan that's been sitting within DEFRA apparently for more than three years, but still has not managed to move out of inboxes. Um, and it's it's that kind of level of of of, of policy that's needed to encourage people to, um, you know, to, to to join in a cohesive effort rather than as we're seeing at the moment a lot of um, uh, a lot of independent um, efforts that do a huge amount of work to try and link as much as they can, you know, across across the the, the, the countries of the UK, as well as cross counties within, um, you know, within parts of the UK. Um, but it just needs that, um, I think, that that higher level to uh, to help push it forwards. Um, the larger strategic projects, um, I think, struggle a little bit to get funding where it's needed out at the the the. the you know the boots on the ground and the grassroots level you know at the moment we see volunteers it's almost uh, personally impacting them financially to do the volunteering work that they do and i think more support needs to be uh, coming through from some of these funded projects to ensure that the the volunteers are not out of pocket in 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 helping deliver that work um you know they uh, i spend most of my time working with the volunteers around around the uk amazing group of people that do amazing things um, but I think that if they get to a stage where they don't feel that the work is appreciated, that it's, you know, impacting them financially and that they're not being supported, then they'll go off and find something else to do, um, which will be obviously at the cost of of what we're trying to do. And so what do you think would be sort of the best and worst case scenarios for the Red Square long term? Um, worst case, I think if the where we've got self-sustaining volunteer groups, if they stop, then we're in a lot of trouble um, because they, you know, they they are the, the the engine that delivers all the data, all the all the information to these larger projects. And um, you know, if that if that's no longer there, and they're the ones that are that are you know out there ensuring that that there is a buffer zone between the remaining red populations and and grey populations. If they stop, then I think you know we. The, the, I think the thing will grind to a halt and red squirrels will disappear as a consequence. Um, I think getting back to what I mentioned earlier, the best case scenario is if if we can have a coordinated plan for the UK as a whole 
um, and combine that with something that we're working on at the moment, which is a landscape scale method of uh, removing um, at best or um, or at least reducing uh, gray squirrel density, then where we've where that has happened, red squirrels have naturally repopulated, um, you know, the woodland and, and forests and rather than relying on translocations where we can do that, that's obviously the best way for um, reds to return to um, to the, the woodlands and forests. It's following on from that. So if we really got our act together, so what might the future look like, not just for red squirrels, but uh, the wider ecosystems across Britain? Um, well, we've always believed that a return of red squirrels to our woodlands and forests is 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 sort of visible evidence of a of a a restoration of balance um, to those ecosystems within the woodlands and forests and for the long term. Um, and what we mean by that is that for most of our current and future juvenile native trees, they'll actually get to make it through to maturity. Um, and obviously, as they become mature trees and as they become ancient trees, then all of the benefit that we currently see from uh, biodiversity in, in those woodlands will continue and will, will, will increase. One of the things that I think isn't clear to uh, uh, a lot of people is that um, the danger to trees comes from there's a, there's a behavioural aspect of um, of all squirrels, red or grey or any other colour, um, which is something called bark stripping. And they do it for two primary reasons. One is as a food source. Another one is for um, materials for dray building and stuff. Um, the the big risk time during the year is in the early to late summer and it's a, a food source the trees that are targeted are typically juvenile um, broadleaf trees so um, oak beech birch uh, rowan um, sweet chestnut um, there those are the trees that are most most at risk and with that once the bark is stripped off it allows the squirrel to get to the, uh, the phloem underneath um, but that bark stripping then leaves the tree wounded and and allows airborne pathogens and, and, and disease and stuff to get into the tree. Worse still, if, if the tree is ring barked, where the where the bark is stripped completely round a major limb or, or indeed the trunk, then everything above that wound effectively dies. Um, so if all squirrels can do that, why is there a difference between uh, reds and greys? And, and we get back to the density issue. Um, one hectare of perfect woodland um, without any supplementary feeding, just in normal wild conditions, can support either one red squirrel or anything from three to 30 grey squirrels based on whichever woodland you happen to be looking at, which studies you're looking at. And it's those that density difference that, that, that makes the difference when when trees are being negatively impacted by uh, a factor of 10 or 20 to one, then it's fairly clear to see why. Um, uh, we've got woodland owners particularly in in the south of england are consciously not planting our native trees because they've seen evidence in the last 30 years of juvenile trees and stands of them not just individual trees but stands of trees being irreparably damaged and and so we're making conscious decisions not to plant native trees anymore which makes no sense so getting back to that point that obviously if the squirrel's been the red squirrel's been here since the ice age um you know, we've had hundreds of years where um, there's been a balance. The, you know, the red squirrel has lived in those woodlands. The woodlands have, have continued to grow and, and, and it was only us chopping them down for various reasons over the last four or five hundred years that's, that, that's, that's really uh, reduced the size. But that, that balance existed before and it, and it, it was, you know, it, it was absolutely fine. Um, clearly, the grey squirrel densities are, are impacting negatively and that's something that can't be sustained. Sure. So uh, finally, Mark, how can members of our audience volunteer, get involved, get in contact with you? Um, I think, I mean, there's lots of things that people can do either for volunteering or, or, or potentially uh, donating if they wish to. But the simplest thing would be to contact me at Mark Henderson, R-S-S-T at gmail.com. And I'll be happy to point them in the right direction and, and, uh, and get them involved. Thank you, Mark. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you.